Counting to God, Part 5. We've been studying the book, uh, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief, by Douglas L., printed in 2014, uh, available on the internet for free. I think uh, Douglas L. wants uh, his journey to be broadcast so that some people who might be following his footsteps may be able to follow a little faster than he did. The front of the book looks like that. Uh, <clears throat> we are in part two, The Science of Belief. Last week we talked about the fact that the universe needed something to get it started, and that something is incredibly powerful. But now we're going to talk about that something that started the universe is not just incredibly powerful, but it is also very careful and accurate. And the question he asked in the chapter on fine-tuning is how can it all be so perfect? He has a couple of quotes, one from Fred Hoyle, he used to be an atheist, in fact, gave the term the Big Bang because he wanted to make fun of the Big Bang Theory. Um, the name stuck, and um, the reason he wanted to make fun of the theory was because he didn't like the theory because it pointed to a beginning and possibly to a God who began it. And Fred Hoyle says, the common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. The only way you could question it is if you had theological differences with it. And then he quotes Isaiah, for this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. And Douglas L. begins the chapter by saying, it is now accepted, I think, by all scientists that if many features of our universe were just slightly different, life could not exist. And that the universe gives at least the appearance of having been designed with almost unimaginable precision. To me, the discoveries of the fine-tuning of the universe are a wonder, the second of, our, of seven in our count to God. Notice that the universe gives at least the appearance of having been designed. You can argue that the universe wasn't designed, but it sure looks like it. And those who don't want to believe it are fighting against the face value of the evidence. If you've ever taken a course in physics, you know it is heavy in math. There are many equations, and some of them have fixed numbers, constants, put in to make those equations work. These con constants of physics have been measured by experiments. One important constant is the gravitational constant, which appears in Newton's law of universal gravitation and in Einstein's theory of general relativity. The gravitational constant measures the strength of the gravitational force. Gravity is much, much weaker than the other three fundamental forces in the universe. But it does have one very important thing going for it. It always attracts. And given an object big enough, such as the Earth or the Sun, or even the Moon, gravity easily dominates. On cosmic scales, gravity is critical. Gravity causes galaxies, stars, and planets to form. Is gravity strong enough to end the current expansion of the universe and cause it to collapse? Or is the expansion of the universe overcoming and weakening the universe's gravitational attraction? The point at which the two factors are in balance is called the critical density of the universe. The ratio of the universe's actual density to the critical density is generally called omega. 
the last letter of the Greek alphabet. A current calculation puts omega within 4% of 1. And here's a reference for that. Gravity and the expansion of the universe are roughly in balance. The universe appears flat, not open, in the sense of runaway expansion, or closed in the sense of ultimate collapse. That it will go and it will just not quite slow down enough to turn around and collapse again. It seems odd that this flatness would exist, but the really amazing part is that conditions had to be set exactly right in the Big Bang for this to happen. If the critical density were very slightly less than one at the Big Bang, then omega would be small today because of runaway expansion. If the critical density were very slightly more than one at the Big Bang, then omega would be large today because of gravitational collapse. It's like shooting a rocket from the Earth so precisely that it hangs in Earth's gravitational field for billions of years on the edge between falling back to Earth and escaping to space. In 1982, Paul Davies wrote The Accidental Universe. A key theme, should have italicized that, a key theme was how sensitive the universe is to certain key factors. Davies wrote, this is difficult, it is difficult not to be struck by some of the surprisingly fortuitous accidents without which our existence would be impossible. Davies estimated in 1982 that Omega was at, that, at this point in the history of the universe between 0 0.01 and 9.0, that is, one hundredth of what it needed to be to be flat, and ten times as what it needed to be to be flat, roughly. Even so, when extrapolating back to the Big Bang, he noted that omega had to be astonishingly close to one, to within one part in ten to the sixty. We now know that Omega is within 4% of 1, so the fine-tuning at the creation of the universe had to be greater than what Davies calculated by about two orders of magnitude. So it's really 10 to the 62 power. In other words, instead of hitting a hole-in-one at the, at the end of the universe, you actually have to hit the middle of the cup precisely. There are other constants of physics that seem to be set just right. One list has 31, and by the way, that is not Hugh Ross's list. That is um, a list of somebody who, uh, as far as I know, is, uh, or was when he published, anyway, an atheist. When I asked my friend Peter Fisher, who is currently head of the physics department at MIT, which of all these coincidences seemed most amazing to him, he said what impressed him most was how close omega was set to exactly one. One in 10 to the 60 is like one proton compared with the protons in a thousand suns. Or imagine marbles one half inch in diameter extending out in all directions 50 light years from Earth. That includes the star Sirius and a few other things like that. Um, packed with marbles. That ball, 600 trillion miles in diameter, has about 10 to the 60 marbles. That's the precision of the gravitational constant alone. Or to be precise, it's a precision of the ratio of the expansion to the gravitational constant. As far as we know, the 31 or so fundamental constants of physics that have been set just right for life are unrelated. There's no reason to think any one of them can be calculated from any of the others. Yet somehow they are all just about perfectly right. The analogy is given of walking into a control room for the universe and finding that all the dials have been set precisely for life. You would not think it was a lucky accident. The most likely explanation would be that some intelligent being had adjusted the dials. A number of distinguished scientists have converted from atheism to belief because of the fine-tuning of the universe. Fred Hoyle was astonished at how precisely nuclear resonance levels were set for the production of carbon and oxygen within stars. He concluded that, quote, a superintellect has monkeyed with the physics. 
more generally, we might ask why exactly it is that we even have the right sort of a universe with the right forces and rules for life to exist. Why, for example, do we have three, dimensions, three directions of space? In a universe with two space dimensions, like an endless sheet of paper, the necessary connections of life could not be made. And in a universe with four or more space dimensions, don't even try to imagine this, Gravity and electromagnetism would not follow this inverse square law. The force is weaker in proportion to the square of the distance. And planets and electrons would not have stable orbits. Why does the force of gravity exist so that matter will gather into clumps? Why is there an electrical force to power the reactions and machines in our body? Why are there nuclear forces so that atoms can form? And so on. What causes it all to be so amazingly perfect? To me, the discovery of the fine-tuning of the universe is the second wonder of modern science. There's certainly disagreement as to what this means, but there's no real disagreement with the existence of fine-tuning even among militant atheists. Both the laws and the constants of physics give the appearance of having been designed for the existence of life. Physicist Freeman Dyson wrote, the more I examine the universe and the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. So unless the universe has a mind of its own, then maybe the maker of the universe knew we were coming, maybe planned for us. Even noted atheist Stephen Hawking, who does not think science requires belief in God, is impressed. The laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge of the electron, and the ratio of the masses of the proton and the electron. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. I'm not reading everything. Um, besides the constants of physics, other items in our universe seem just about right. One is the chemical compound we call water. To me, the special properties of water suggest design. According to Michael Denton, if the properties of water were not almost precisely what they are, carbon-based life would, be, would in all probability be impossible. Life is a chemical system that operates in water. Our bodies are mostly water. Water is pretty much the universal solvent and is now thought to be the only solvent in which life can arise. A molecule, a molecule of water has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. However, in contrast to, say, carbon dioxide, it is not symmetric. The side with the two hydrogen atoms has a slight positive electric charge, and the side away from the hydrogen atoms has a slight negative electric charge. For this reason, water is cohesive. It sticks together. It has surface tension. For this reason, water breaks apart and dissolves compounds like salt that are held together by loose electrons. Molecules that are held together by shared electrons, covalent bonds, are not affected because oil an organic compound and water don't mix, the proteins in our bodies don't dissolve. Another amazing feature of water is that ice floats. As liquid water cools, it is most dense at about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Sometimes when you're out swimming, you can tell the water just a few feet below you is cooler. But when water freezes, it expands about 9% and ice floats. Were it otherwise, rivers and oceans would freeze from the bottom up and many scientists think life on Earth would not have survived. He goes on to say, some scientists believe there were periods before 650 million years ago when the entire surface of the Earth froze over. And that certainly is a popular theory. Water also has a fairly wide range of temperature when it is in liquid form. The range between its freezing and boiling points is 100 degrees centigrade and 180 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, the range for methane is 21 degrees centigrade. And incidentally, the, uh, the range for carbon dioxide is zero. It goes directly from going, being a solid to a gas at uh, normal pressure. It takes a lot of energy compared to most compounds to heat water up. One of the highest specific heats known to man. So water holds heat well and keeps our bodies warm. And there are a few other things, like it modulates climate. I want to conclude this chapter with one more example of exactly how fine-tuned our universe appears to be. 
comes from Roger Penrose, a respected English physicist. He calculated that at the moment of the Big Bang, the universe was highly ordered. One result of the very high degree of order is the second law of thermodynamics. The amount of disorder is always increasing. Penrose stated that the phase state of the universe had to be precisely calibrated to something like one part in a number with 10 to the 23 uh, to the 123 zeros to create a universe as special as ours. You have to be careful how you calculate disorder. For example, heat is a kind of disorder, but it can be done for the universe to have evolved to look the way it does now. The initial conditions had to be set in a very special way. It looks designed. Really looks designed. This really is an unimaginable fine tuning. As Penrose notes, one could not even write the number down because the number of zeros is much greater than the number of particles in the visible universe. Here's an example that may help you visualize how big Penrose's number really is. How incredibly unlikely it is to win a lottery where the odds are one in a number with 10 to the 123 zeros. We'll get there in four steps. The first is, step is you win a lottery where your odds are 1 in 10 to the 80. This is like picking the exact lucky particle out of the entire visible universe. Winning a Powerball lottery 9 or 10 times in a row, or picking the ace of spades out of a deck of cards 46 times in a row. For the second step, you have to win this same impossible lottery picking the exactly correct lucky particle out of the entire visible universe every single second for the entire age of the universe, 14 billion years. Every single second for 14 billion years, you are lucky enough to pick the particular particle in the universe that won you this impossible lottery. That amount of luck gets you to step two. In his celebrated volumes, historian Will Durant opens with the following image of time. High up in the north, in the land called Svithjad, there stands a rock. It is 100 miles wide, pardon, high and 100 miles wide. Once every thousand years, a little bird comes to this rock to sharpen its beak. When the rock has thus been worn away, then a single day of eternity will have gone by. <laughs> Let's play with this image. Supposing our little bird, when sharpening its beak, dislodges only one atom from this immense rock. In fact, it's going to be a hydrogen atom. Uh, this is such a small loss that even after a trillion visits taking atoms from the same spot, the change would probably not be visible to the naked eye. Suppose our little bird doesn't scratch his beak every thousand years but instead comes only once every 14 billion years. That is, once in the entire age of the universe. And suppose that as these unimaginable aeons slip by, every single second you are lucky enough to pick the right particle in the entire visible universe. Every second for 14 billion years, you pick the exact right particle in the universe. Perhaps at one second, an electron passing through the Andromeda galaxy, perhaps another second a proton being swallowed by a black hole 10 billion light years away, and so on. And all this luck corresponds to just one atom coming off this massive rock every 14 billion years. <coughs> Let me say that again. To take a single atom off this rock, you have to be lucky enough to pick the right particle in the entire visible universe every second for 14 billion years. You have to have the luck of step two. To get from step two to step three, you have to repeat the luck of step two without fail as many times as there are atoms in this massive rock. By the time the little bird has worn away the entire rock, we are approaching the fine-tuning of the Big Bang, fine-tuning to one part uh, in a number with 123 zeros. But we're not there yet. We need just one more adjustment. For step four, Instead of the rock being a cube 100 miles high, 100 miles wide, and 100 miles deep, imagine a rock that is 300 million light years high, 300 million light years wide, and 300 million light years deep. That's about 2 billion trillion miles.
miles of solid rock or three times 10 to the 24th meters of solid rock in each direction. And that little bird comes along every, once every 14 billion years to scratch one atom off of it. <laughs> Meanwhile, until the entire rock has been worn away, somehow you are lucky enough every second to pick exactly the right particle in the universe. That one, that one, that one. Time after time after time after time. That gives you a sense of the precision, the luck, the fine-tuning that Roger Penrose calculates took place at the Big Bang when our universe was created. <coughs> what would the odds have to be for you to believe in God? Chapter 9, Problems with the Multiverse. Is there more than one universe? And the quote attributed to Albert Einstein is only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> to most people, the word universe means everything. The totality of existence, the complete contents of intergalactic space. Everything we will ever be able to observe or measure is in our universe. It is hard to see how we could ever observe or measure something not in our universe. Yet many scientists believe our universe is an insignificant part of a much grander scheme, a collection of universes they usually call the multiverse. These scientists believe existing universes can somehow spin off uni new universes. For example, they suggest new universes may be created inside black holes, objects so massive that nothing, not even light, can escape. Perhaps, but since there is no way to test whether it's true, it's clearly just a belief. These scientists believe that in another part of the multiverse, in a different universe, the rules could be different. There could be different forces and constants of physics, perhaps even different dimensions. The multiverse has enormous intuitive appeal to atheists. You don't have to be an atheist to believe in the multiverse. There are people who believe in both God and the multiverse, but if you are an atheist, you're likely loving the multiverse concept. If you believe in the multiverse, then our universe is not unique and perhaps not so special. Atheists typically blend two further beliefs into the multiverse concept. First, they believe the multiverse contains an infinite number of universes. This belief allows them to sidestep the philosophic problem of the first cause. If there are only a finite number of universes, however large, then at least one of these universes would have, been a, would have to be an original, a great granddaddy universe, and created, not created by any other universe. An atheist would have to confront the unanswerable, within the atheist worldview, question of what caused that great granddaddy universe to exist, what brought it into a being. Atheists don't like that question. So they generally sidestep it by believing that the multiverse contains an infinite number of universes, universes without beginning and without end. The second belief atheists add to the multiverse concept is that the constants of physics and even the laws of physics change from one universe to another. That's to get rid of that unbelievably well-set dial problem. Well, you know, some universe had to have it. And it's the only one that can support life, and so we're there, so why are we surprised? Atheists believe this universe-creating mechanism somehow has the ability to spew out new laws of physics with different constants. This belief, coupled with the belief in an infinite number of universes, allow atheists to sidestep the scientific fact that our universe is fine-tuned for the existence of life. Notice, sidestep the scientific fact. The fact is there. They can't deny it. They're just trying to ignore it or explain it away somehow. If you believe in this kind of multiverse, then fine-tuning is not surprising. In an infinite number of universes, some would be expected to have the constants of physics set just right to allow life to exist. And since we are life in our universe, the laws and constants of physics are set just right. When you stop and think about it, this in the universe-creating mechanism would have to be incredibly powerful and versatile. 
In our universe, the number of spatial dimensions, three, is just right, a point that Martin Rees makes in his book, Just Six Numbers, and we reviewed some of the reasons for that. One dimension of time seems just fine. Our four fundamental forces seem to work well. The strong and weak nuclear forces bond the nuclei of atoms together and break some of them apart. The electrical force powers all chemical reactions, including how we walk and talk and think. And the gravitational force creates galaxies, stars, and planets. The proton, the neutron, and the electron, the three basic particles of ordinary matter, seem to work amazingly well together to create all of the elements and the structure in our universe, and I might add the molecules as well. If we are to believe that none of these features was designed, then we need to believe the multiverse contains every possible variation. The multiverse must create new laws of physics based on different numbers of dimensions, as well as new and varied concepts of space and time, different fundamental particles, and so on. Probably in more ways than we can currently express or know, because we are still learning how our universe works. Also, it would seem, at least to me and to many others, that anything capable of creating universes with different features and constants would have to be more complicated than the universe it creates. A bread machine is more complicated and requires more technology and design than a loaf of bread. An automobile factory is more complicated and requires more technology and design than the automobiles that roll off the production lines. So to summarize the discussion so far, this atheist multiverse includes a number of fundamental beliefs. One, our universe is one of an infinite number of universes. Two, there is some type of universe creating mechanism that spews out new universes with totally different and alien dimensions, laws, features, and constants of physics, as well as starting initial conditions. Three, somehow, for no special reason, all of this just exists. There's a principle of science called Occam's razor, which loosely stated suggests that explanations with a smaller number of unproven assumptions are more likely to be correct. To me, belief in God is simpler than the atheist's belief of an infinite multiverse with changing laws, dimensions, constants, and features of physics. The multiverse has been called a flagrant violation of Occam's razor. I agree with that statement, but that's just me, and I'm sure others see it differently. It also seems clear that, given the enormous chasm between the worldviews of belief and scientism, perceptions of simplicity are not likely to be a deciding factor. That's probably because, in most cases, they weren't the motivation in the first place. What is most strange about the universe concept, multiverse concept, is the refusal by many scientists to admit it is only a belief. There is no evidence that other universes exist or that the laws and constants of physics can change. Absolutely none. Yet hundreds of peer-reviewed articles on the multiverse have been published in scientific books and journals. If you count articles published simply by posting on internet sites, there are thousands of scientific articles on the multiverse. What strikes me as plainly wrong is that these articles rarely admit that the multiverse is an unsupported belief. The multiverse is science fiction, not science fact. Yet magazines run headline articles about the multiverse. I think many people see the headlines and assume that if it's discussed in science magazines, it must be real. Even if you read the articles closely, they rarely admit that there's no scientific evidence that the multiverse exists. Stephen Hawking tells of a lady who, after a lecture about the universe, stated she believed Earth was supported by a giant tortoise. When asked what the tortoise was supported by, she responded, very clever young man, but it's turtles all the way down. Hawking perhaps intended to suggest that there are a lot of strange theories about the universe, but I would turn it against him and other multiverse believers. What supports the multiverse? To me, the infinite multiverse is turtles all the way down, a preposterous science fiction concoction. I also think it is wrong, and a clear error in logic, to suggest, as many atheists have done, that these theories above and beliefs in multiple universes, pardon me, of theories about and beliefs in multiple universes, somehow confirm or even imply that God does not exist. It is interesting to note that while any suggestion of design in the universe is immediately attacked as unscientific, 
These scientism anti-faith articles that profess belief in multiple universes are widely accepted and sail through peer review. There is clear bias against belief in God. If one wants to believe that there are an infinite number of other universes with different laws, dimensions, constants, and features of physics, and all of this is just exists for no reason, then to be intellectually honest, one should admit that belief in God is at least equally reasonable. The accepted scientific fact of creation implies that something exists outside of our universe, something outside of our reality. There is no reason to think we will ever have scientific proof that other universes exist. There's ample room for wonder. Believers in the multiverse generally ignore a subtle but serious mathematical problem. The problem arises because they believe the number of other uh, universes is infinite. Infinity is strange. It exists only as an idea, as a mathematical concept. As far as we know for sure, nothing in this universe is infinite. Infinity is not some cute but shy number always hiding over the next hill. Infinity is not just a number that is always a little out of reach. Infinity is a monstrously alien concept. Carl Frederick Gauss, perhaps the greatest mathematician to ever live, said that one should not attempt to look directly at infinity. Suppose there were a number of measurement uh, scales, a number measurement scale with a dial. Suppose at one end of the scale is the number one and at the other end is infinity. So when we measure the number two, it looks like the illustration below. You really can't see where two is. For practical purposes, it's right on top of one. Now, the dial points to the same place as one. It has not moved in any way closer to infinity. When you go from one to two, you don't get any closer to infinity. Now, let's measure the biggest number you can possibly think of. It has to be a number that can be expressed in a finite number of steps. You can't say, add one to itself in an infinite number of times. We got a sense of earlier of how big a number with 10 to the 123 zeros is. Supposing we start with 1 trillion, and we take 10 to that number, create a new number with 1 trillion zeros. Then take that number and make it the exponent of a new power of 10. So 10 to the 10 to the, to the, uh, uh, to the 1 trillion. Create a new number that has 10 to the 1 trillion zeros. We continue this process where we keep taking 10 to a power equal to the prior number. We use the prior number as the exponent for the next. And we do that 1 trillion times. Okay? By the third step, much less the trillionth step, we have a number hugely bigger than a number with 10 to the 123 zeros. Supposing the number we get after doing this is 1 trillion times my big number, and supposing that you and every person on Earth creates their own big number. Now, imagine we multiply all of them together. The big numbers of every person on Earth. Call this our big monster number. Let's put it in our number measurement scale. The needle hasn't budged. Whoa, the big monster number has not budged the dial. It is no closer to infinity than the number two. You cannot get partway to infinity. However far you go, you are still no closer to infinity than when you started. The gap between finite numbers and infinity cannot be crossed. That is the essence of why infinity is a strange concept. In all our human experience, when we move towards something, we get at least a little bit closer. Infinity doesn't work that way. When you realize how alien and monstrous the concept of infinity actually is, I think it becomes very hard to believe there really are an infinite number of other universes. <coughs> infinity can break itself up into an infinite number of groups, each of which is also infinite, and every bit as large as the original infinity. If something can ever possibly happen with any chance whatsoever, no matter how small, then in an infinite number of universes it has happened infinitely often. If there are an infinite number of universes, then regardless of how small the probability may be that one of them is a universe with exact, exactly the same physical laws as ours, there are an infinite number of universes exactly like ours. Furthermore, with exactly the same 
initial conditions. But as they like to say on TV, wait, there's more. If there are an infinite number of universes exactly like ours, then it, regardless of how small the probability may be that exactly all the atoms in your body are put together exactly right to make you, there are or have been or will be an infinite number of persons exactly like you. Can you really believe that there have been an infinite number of universes just like our own with persons just like you in every respect with your exact name and history who are doing or have done exactly what you're doing now? If you believe in an infinite number of universes, then you must. Infinity is a monster that cannot be tamed in the real world. <coughs> However, in the world of ideas, the, number of, uh, the world of number, infinity can be fun. Appendix B illustrates why infinity is such a strange concept and how mathematicians use it. This chapter began with the question, is there more than one universe? Science can't answer that question. Not now and probably not ever. So you have a choice of beliefs. Each belief has logical consequences. If you choose to believe our universe is all there is, then something outside our universe caused our universe to come into being. That's something, that first cause, could be God, could be the God of the Bible. So this belief is consistent with Abrahamic faith. The fine tuning of this universe, the proven fact that it is just about perfect for life, is also consistent with Abrahamic faith. If you choose to believe there are other universes, but a finite number of other universes, then at least one of them was not created by another universe. At least one universe just is, just exists. What caused that universe to exist? What was its first cause? That's something that first cause could have been, again be God and could again be the God of the Bible. So this belief is also consistent with Abrahamic faith, but clearly it is not how most people interpret the Bible. And here also the fine tuning of our universe is perhaps less of a surprise, but perhaps still a surprise. If you choose to believe that, one, we are part of a multiverse that contains an infinite number of other universes, two, that this multiverse has always existed, and three, that this multiverse has the ability to create new universes with different laws, dimensions, constants, and features of physics, then you can sidestep the philosophical implications of a first cause and the fine-tuning of the universe that we happen to be in. But you must recognize the mathematical problem described above. There are an infinite number of persons exactly like you in every respect. And you are no closer to the first cause. What caused that unwieldy multiverse to exist? Atheists say it just does, perhaps. But that is a belief. It's not science. My take I think Douglas Ellis pointed out the anthropic coincidence as well, and they're really undisputed, as he notes. As he notes, the only remotely plausible atheistic answer for them is the multiverse. His arguments against the multiverse are good. I think they can be strengthened in three ways. Number one, the multiverse is a transparent dodge to get away from the implications of design. There are those who claim that physics pushes us towards the multiverse. They claim that inflation or black holes or big crunches or the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics or mathematical possibility or some other feature of presumed reality creates new universes willy-nilly. But inflation is simply a way to explain the, ex a way the extreme smoothness of the original universe. Otherwise, one would simply have said that the Big Bang was designed and was therefore that smooth. See, you have inflation so that you don't have to have a designer for the Big Bang to begin with. Which means that if inflation means that there are multiple universes, well, that's... It came from trying to explain things without a designer. Entropy should preclude an infinite series of Big Bangs and Big Crunches which is another way of saying that we have infinite universes because they're just sequential. 
And it is not even completely clear that black holes exist, let alone that they can create entire un new universes. You may remember we talked about that a few weeks back. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is simply a way to explain that a quantum waveform never really collapses, which might require an observer um, and perhaps an ultimate observer. The idea that the possibility of a universe means that it is real fails to distinguish between ideas and physical reality. And in any case, in that case, it is possible that God exists, in which case, by this theory, God is real. And by the way, he exists for every universe, at least as a first cause. None of the creative mechanisms for making multiple universes are really required except to rescue materialism in the first place. It is all special pleading of the kind that atheists like to charge religious people with making. Second, if we are in an infinite multiverse, there is no such thing as physical laws ruling out miracles. In some universes, at least, bodies of water may part to allow escaping slaves to walk through them, then close back over their pursuers. While we may not expect that ahead of time, if reliable witnesses say it happened, physical law does not require us not to believe in them. Because anything that can happen, if we see it happen, then it happened. In addition, we can have no firm belief that scientific experiments should be reproducible. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. While we may expect that at first, if it doesn't happen, we have no particular reason to argue for fraud or incompetence. Just one of those things that happens, the experiment didn't come out right. We just live in a universe where what we think of as the laws of physics do not always apply. Strict belief in the multi multiverse destroys the ability to do science. Finally, there's the argument of Douglas Sachs, which uh, in fairness to uh, Douglas L., was printed after uh, Douglas L.'s book. Most universes that allowed for life should be quite bleak. They should barely allow for life, or perhaps barely allow for the ability to think. If we find ourselves in a particularly rich and beautiful universe, it argues that our universe is not random from the aspect of life-supporting universes, and perhaps a designer picked our universe for us. In which case, there is no necessity for there to be multiple universes, let alone an infinity of universes. If you've got a God, why do you need the multiverse? But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Sure. Um, how popular is the multiple universe idea becoming? Is it on the upswing? Are they enrolling more and more advocates? Or, or are the critics of it coming out of the woodwork and now maybe the idea is on the decline? Mm -hmm. I don't know the literature, but maybe someone here does. Well, you may remember uh, that we had a... Uh, uh, we looked at the um, article by Eugene Koonin that said the multiverse actually gives us an answer to the origin of life. Uh, and the critics said you're edging too close to intelligent design. Well, the fact of the matter is that the facts argue for intelligent design. Eugene Koonin is conceding that they do. He's using the multiverse to rescue him from that situation. What's happening is that people are starting to realize that it's not just the universe or just the fine-tuning of the universe 
that needs explanation. There are other things too. And once you have the multiverse, why it explains everything. But it becomes more and more obvious that the facts support intelligent design. Notice I didn't use the word intelligent. But yeah. There is a design. There is Once a design. They that, it's just chance. It has to be chance. Um, but. Uh, but not really chance, because once you once you can see uh, uh, infinite universes infinitely varied, which you have to have the variation as well as the uh, as well as the infinity in order to get in order to explain why our universe is precisely looks designed. Uh, I think what's happening is that that in general people are starting to realize that. There's no way around it. The prima facie evidence is for design. And all of these other things are just desperate attempts to avoid the obvious. Um, you can argue as to whether the evidence uh, you know, favors a young age for the Earth. Uh, and there are certainly those who maintain that it doesn't. Um, but you can't argue not not really using evidence. You can't argue that the universe doesn't look designed, and for that matter, the life doesn't look designed, which is why Richard Dawkins started out saying, you know, biology is a study of complicated objects that give the appearance of design. And he's not the only one. What is our working definition of science? Uh, well, you know, that's a, that's a big dispute. What is the definition of science? And I, one, of the, one, of the things that, one of the things that I find is interesting is that, uh, you know, when I was at the other Sabbath school, um, one of the people there said the problem is that you're stuck with the 19th century definition of science. And he argued that we really should be using a 20th definition, and that is that no miracles are allowed. Which, okay, if you want to shift the definition of science from the 19th century, if you want to call it that, to the 21st century, uh, it was interesting because he didn't say the 20th century, which would have really been a better fit. <laughs> but... Uh, um, uh, if you're going to shift the definition of science that way, then science no longer has the kind of hold on people that the 19th century definition did. What, what was that? Well, the 19th century definition of science is very simple. It is um, the study of if I can put it this way, probably the most accurate way of saying it is the study of the reproducible. Which means that if you can do it in one laboratory and somebody else can do it in another laboratory, that makes it science. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, and that means that it, in order to do science, you have to have laws that work all over the place, including both laboratories. And if you have a laboratory in the moon, it should presumably work there too, uh, with appropriate adjustments for the air pressure and so forth. Um, and um, and that's what most people think when they mean science, and that has a great deal of power, uh, because if if let's say people's different people's cancers have certain commonalities between them then you can take advantage of those commonalities to cure it. Uh, maybe chemotherapy, maybe surgery, maybe radiation, maybe immunotherapy, maybe some combination of them that, that you can show work in all these other patients. And so therefore, you can assume that the new patient who comes in who has cancer, you can say, well, we have these, and they work this well. And 
if it's choriocarcinoma, you know, if you're not going to die in the next three days, we can cure you. See? Uh, which took a basically 100% fatal disease and turned it into 100% curable disease. And that's what people think about when they think science. Oh, it makes our lives much better because it's reliable. I want to talk to my brother in uh, Washington State. So I dial up the phone and, you know, with the science of how my cell phone works and the technology that's in the radio transmitters that go over there, I can speak to him and he can hear me and we can recognize each other's voices. You know, think back 200 years ago and people would have thought, you can't do that, you're nuts. And that's one of the things that science has brought us. But that's the old 19th century definition of science, which says that you're studying the reproducible and then you're taking advantage of those reproducibilities. So it's really science and technology. Now, if you're defining science as how do you explain this all without God, well, that doesn't have the same pedigree. And yet, what you'll find time and time and time again is people trying to persuade you that if you believe in antibiotics, then you've got to believe that uh, this life on this earth is millions of years old and God had nothing to do with it. Why? Because it's all science. It's called bait and switch in the advertising industry. Yes. <clears throat> um, not so long ago, people used to bandy around arguments about time being the miracle worker. And with sufficient time, why the impossible can become possible, and the possible becomes probable, and the probable becomes certain. Nowadays, we've yeah, come face to face with the wall yeah. that the whole universe isn't old enough to explain all That's these right. Things. In order to get enough time, you need more universes. So now we need more universes. Uh, does one see a common theme here repeating itself? It seems like we keep wanting to resort to infinity while claiming that we're not admitting any miracles. Right, right. Uh, how, how does that work? Well, it's very simple. <laughs> it's very simple. You don't want God at all costs. And I maintain that if you keep going yeah, there, but it will be literally at all costs, including your sanity. Yeah, but, but may, I, may I suggest that miracle is anything we don't understand. Is it not? I mean, if somebody were to come alive from a hundred years ago, they would be faced with all kinds of miracles, including the projection on the screen here. Yes. That, that would be... Them, uh, well, it probably would have other. to be more like 150. Okay, well, let's, uh, well but, we, can, uh, we can adjust. It's a matter of time. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but, but, you know, the irony is that the very things which science has enabled to come transpire is now being used as evidence the very things we would otherwise have identified as miracles are now from henceforth impossible. Does that not mean that we have no longer anything left to learn? What it means is that there's one personality that actually knows how we ought to operate. And designed us that way. And the fact of the matter is that most of us, in fact, to be precise, all but one of us, um, 
start out not liking that person because, in fact, we're on the wrong side. And that's really where it comes down to. And so the attempt to get that person off of our back continues by any means possible. And if we have to, we will deny things like, mm -hmm. well, anything that has a beginning has a cause. Well, what about quantum mechanics? Not realizing that quantum mechanics opens its whole uh, uh, other uh, can of worms for them. You, you can't get away from this, no matter how hard you try. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there is an intelligence that made us, that knows how we ought to behave, and we don't like behaving that. Uh, we have been twisted and we have to start by acknowledging that and deciding to change course. And until that happens, we will find ourselves attracted to these ways of saying, but that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Matter of fact, he doesn't exist. Uh, excellent chapter. And uh, excellent evaluation afterwards. Uh, just cogitating a little bit about this, uh, I asked myself the question. Uh, and he admitted, of course, that causality f finally runs out and you put God in there. Uh, the scientist will come to you and he'll say, uh, okay, I put, I put multiverses in there. Are we both on the same level? I would say no. I'd say no simply because uh, there's the multiverse is purely speculative. Uh, the idea that there is a God is not purely speculative because we have so many evidences for this, not only in the design and all the fine tuning that you showed. And it's, uh, all the examples he gave, and there's an infinite number beyond what he gave us. Well, he's going to give us five more evidences, and their um, uh, and their evidences for God's interaction inside the universe. And I find myself much more comfortable in a rational mode uh, in that particular milieu than being in the milieu of hey, an infinite number of universes of which you have no, more, no evidence for more than one of which you can have evidences for no more than one. By definition, of course, uh, right now. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, it, 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 it is almost the definition of metaphysical. So, rationally, I'm more comfortable with God than I'm with multiverses. Well, you know, the interesting... The interesting thing of it is that somebody once postulated this is the the uh, best of all possible universes. It's arguable that um, given some of our choices, maybe uh, it's not the best of all possible universes. But most of that's our choices, not 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 uh, the creator of the universe. Um, and. You know, if the Bible is correct, it may turn out that it was the best of all possible universes until various beings decided that um, they wanted to try to make it better, by better meaning more congenial to themselves, I guess. If you, want to, if you want to reject rationality, then of course go the multiverse route. Well, but, uh, as uh, I say, the the point is that you reject things, you reject things, you reject things. They're tied to other things. You have to reject them. The thread of truth will keep on heading towards you, and you just have to keep cutting it off uh, further and further behind because it'll, um, and eventually you'll wind up cutting off everything. And you know the the ultimate 
is kind of the nihilism of people like Sartre. The complicating problem here is that uh, this really wild idea of multiverses rides on the uh, coattails of a very successful science. And uh, it's riding on the coattails, though. It's not actually producing any extra power. No, none whatsoever. Have our science textbooks then revised the definition science? What, what's happening in our schools as far as? Most of the time, nobody talks about that. Um, the, the definition of science of. Uh, if they make it too plain, it becomes obvious it's theological. And so they don't say too much. The National Academy of Sciences had a definition once that said that it was the most, the, uh, finding the best naturalistic explanation for phenomena. Now, right there you've already that's a definition Del for uh, delved in. And what happened was that uh, when it came to people's attention, they backed off. It's a definition for, for atheism. Yeah, of course it is. It's, it, it basically what it says is that science must be made friendly to atheists. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know, uh, I mean, just being, just being upfront about this, if you want to know why intelligent design and short age creationism draw the biggest fire, it's because intelligent design and short age creationism go after it saying that the universe has evidence of design and it's really hard to deny it. And basically what they're saying is that the universe is not friendly to atheists, and them's fighting words. You can be a theistic evolution who believes God is in charge of this whole thing, but he did it all through a process that you can't tell from just uh, nature operating on its own. They're happy with that, because that God is an add-on, and he doesn't really do anything, and the atheist can ignore him. If you, on the other hand, believe that God did the, through a process and his activity can be detected, now you're not friendly to atheists anymore. And this is the difference between Kenneth Miller, whom you may recognize his name on biology textbooks every once in a while, and Michael Behe. They're both Catholics. Kenneth Miller's written a book on the kind of God he believes in, and it's a God that worked through evolution, and he wants to be part of the Abrahamic religions and all of that stuff. But he's not challenging the idea that the universe is atheist friendly. He won't touch that. Whereas, Michael B. he says, Look at the evidence. This doesn't make sense. It looks like a designer did it. And here's why. And Michael Behe would have lost his job a long time ago, except that he has tenure and they can't fire him. Ken Miller is accepted to, to talk all the time, especially if he talks against Michael Behe. They're both Catholic. Their theology is no different from each other. But Michael B. he looks at the science and says, there's no way this happened through some kind of a non-directed uh, process. And Ken Miller will try to say, yes, it doesn't need a direction. Mm. And that's the difference. But and if you really want to know, that is the precise line between intelligent design and the newer form of theistic evolution. 
It used to be that theistic evolution could say, well, maybe you can detect it, maybe you can't. But theistic evolution, the meaning of it has gradually changed in usage to the idea that you really can't detect it. And atheists are happy with that because they just, you know, they're useful idiots. The United States is heading in a direction of common core, not just mathematics. N not just mathematics, but we have a new um, social studies series now. Um, no longer in fourth grade, for example, throughout the United States, will the state history be taught. And this is coming from Washington, D.C., I guess. I, I'm not sure. I don't mean... Well, we, we'll see what happens. It, Trump does not seem to be too friendly to Common Core at this point. Well, and I, and I don't mean uh, Donald Trump, but I do mean that... The people we've, that We've already him. done Common Core math. Now we have a Common Core Social Studies, which our school is adopting. But the General Conference, in the meantime, has come out with a new science called By Design. That's, that's the name of the new science we've gotten. So I'm just wondering if the United States is headed in a direction, and that's why I'm wondering about textbooks and definitions, if there's going to be a common core that will go throughout the United States in a scientific way, because they've already done it now with two major courses. So it, we could be in very interesting times as far as children are concerned in elementary and junior high. I don't know about high school. Well, as a matter of fact, I think there's a concerted push to try to get certain concepts into the schools, specifically because they realize that they're not really reaching um, the, the children that they want to. Um, if you think about it, uh, about 40 to 45 percent, depending on the survey, uh, of, of Americans will say that humans originated less than 10,000 years ago and God was involved in the process. And in spite of all of the education that has been done, that number has remained relatively constant. There's another number that says that humans originated millions of years ago and God had a hand in the process. And that number uh, has been decreasing slightly. It used to be about 40%. It's now down to about 35%. And in the meantime, the atheist position, uh, humans originated millions of years ago and God had no hand in the process, assuming there's a God. Um, that position has gone up from about, uh, originally it was what, about 5% and it's now up to 15 so that position has been greening ground slowly. Um, there are people who are looking at that and saying, you know, this is not good for our country, and I, I think it's arguable that they're correct. Um, there are other people who are looking at it and saying, why can't we make inroads in all those knuckleheads? And Common Core is one way of trying to make inroads. You see, we're going to have science, we're going to have to do this by the book, we're going to do this the right way, not that book. Um, and um, we're going to teach people math correctly, we're going to teach people science correctly, now we're going to teach people sociology correctly, and we're going to have people looking at it from our point of view. And part of that is that they change the standardized testing. So if you're a school and you're concerned about how your students do on standardized testing, you're going to want to incorporate 
the textbooks that are, you know, in support yes. of. Well, uh, this, this gets back to another interesting part of that whole, you know, the, the question of what is education and how, and how should we be educating and so forth. Uh, you may, if you read the literature, you will find that, for example, uh, students in America uh, and people in America in general are much worse educated than people in, let's say, France or Great Britain. Uh, they do poorly on, science, on a quick science quiz, which is like 10 questions. Uh, one of them was, uh, had to do with the universe started at a Big Bang. One of them had to do, I mean, a bunch of other ones are pretty obvious science stuff that, that's pretty non-controversial. Uh, one of them was that, you know, humans originated from chimpanzees, and I think, I, I'm trying to remember what the, the third, uh, there's a third one that was kind of in that general area. And, um, and the interesting thing is that we were second, on, or, uh, second worst only to Turkey. <laughs> Why Turkey, I guess, because the Islamic uh, influence, I think. But, uh, but we were the lowest on the, on the uh, you know, Western European scale. But if you re-ask the question and say, scientists say that the universe started with the Big Bang, scientists say that humans came from chimpanzees, Americans do just fine. We actually know what they want to say. We just don't believe it. Yes. Yeah, I can't resist commenting on what we're discussing here, and then I'll move to another related topic. Um, if we were in the UK, there's uh, ominous storm clouds regarding teaching creation and Christian ideas. Just recently there was a proposal, I don't know if it went through, with their Office of Education, and that's to make it illegal to teach creation in UK schools and get accreditation. I get that from a website, a creationist website. I don't think that went through yet. Otherwise, we would have heard about it. But that's the direction things are going, and it could happen in this country. It can involve accreditation, which is, to me, really ominous. And that's a way to drive uh, private schools out of business, by the way. There are Christian private schools in the UK. So we need to keep our eye on that. Yeah. Uh, of interest that, that uh, for the last, I don't know how long, the, the uh, uh, spelling contests in the U.S. have been won by uh, people in private schools. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, yeah. it is, uh, or homeschooled. Yeah, homeschooled. And, and it, it, I mean, it's just, it's just fascinating because you can see what's happening is that these people are seeing, again, they're seeing two things and they're fusing them into one. If you believe in science and you believe in all of science, including evolution, yeah. see, uh, you 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 take the whole package and and so, and so they read illiteracy as people don't have the right education, which of course includes evolution. And so they're trying to fix both of them at the same time because they don't even distinguish between the two. Uh, and, and you have to you have to understand the mindset because that's the mindset for them there is no difference when i try to make a distinction between microevolution and macroevolution they go what you know and and for that reason i i try to avoid macroevolution because um the real question is not microevolution and macroevolution the real question is microevolution and mega evolution which is to say you know, changes in family, Ge uh, not genus and species, that happens. Um, it's, it's mo in most cases, it's on the family level. In humans, because I think of a poor classification scheme, it's on the genus level. Um, but that's, uh, but uh, you talk to them about, 
whole macroevolution is just more microevolution. What are you talking about? What, why are you making that distinction? Because it's just a, gra a gradual matter of degree. Uh, and, and so what's happened is the two fairly distinct concepts, ones that they really admit to themselves in, in quiet, they're not making a distinction. And the reason I say that is because mega evolution is actually a creation of, uh, I believe it's George Gaylord Simpson, who's a standard evolutionist. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it was interesting. I had a, uh, a discussion, uh, well, debate kind of, but not not in the standard variety where we, you know, have timers and all that kind of stuff. You speak for 15 minutes, you speak for 15 minutes, and so forth. It was opening statements, and then it was more of a discussion kind of thing afterwards. Um, so it's informal, but um, the guy was insisting that punctuated equilibrium was the explanation for new species, not new uh, families. And I went, whoa, I don't know where you read that one. Uh, but it is, in fact, uh, it, the, 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 the missing links are mostly on the family and class and order level. They're not on the species level. Well, of course, it doesn't answer the question, but that's not the... The, the real question is not whether punctuated equilibrium answers this, the species question. The real question is, what do you do with mega evolution? Yeah, and punctuated equilibrium and, is that the species and level and so on. Gould's explanation yeah. and so on uh, did not get into mega evolution. Which means it couldn't touch it? It couldn't touch it, exactly. And um, the reason why it's not, uh, the reason why it's better explained in the species level is because it might work there, it doesn't work at the other level. Oh, sure, it, it's, uh, it's okay at that level, but uh, it's not where the problem is. Yeah. Um, while I have the mic, maybe I can add a, another thought or two that is very recent. Um, one definition of science is to see something. Observation followed by um, hypotheses and conclusions and further extrapolation and further observations. So but that's really the study of the reproducible. That's right. And so science is seeing, using our powers, and I'm not just talking with eyesight, I'm talking about using instruments any way that we can see the world around us. Uh, that's one definition of science. Uh, interestingly, I came back uh, this morning from a, a very good sermon at Azure Hills. I go there almost every week for service. And um, the theme of the sermon was we walk by faith, not by sight. And to, to a lot of us who are especially trained in the sciences, it's like kind of throwing out science because science involves sight. And do we have to take everything by faith? And this speaker was very good, one of our pastors, uh, Pastor Snell. He was saying that faith leads to sight. The result of belie believing is seeing. And you see the world in a different way. See? So what I've extrapolated from that is that you have various starting points. You can start with what you see and then move on to what you believe. And that's what our author is doing in this book. Yeah. You start with science, which mm -hmm. is seeing. Or you can start with a faith proposition and then move into seeing and supporting your faith. And a lot of the uh, Christian creationist groups are in that camp. They'll start with uh, Genesis 1 and Exodus 20 and so on. And so they move from a faith position into a science position and then bring it together. Um, you can also um, do variations of this, which um, may cause problems. But uh, anyway, I, I like the idea of uh, believing is seeing. 
That's what I came came home with today. Believing is seeing. Thank you. Well, I'm going to make one other case, and that is that um, most of the time we judge reality by our own experience. And while it may something may be true until we've actually experienced it for ourselves, it doesn't really strike home. That's right. And I think that there is a case for saying, and you know, my theory says if you look over here, you're going to find this, and everybody else thinks you're going to find something different. And you look over there, and you find this, and you realize that everybody else's expectations were inaccurate. That gives you a tremendous amount of faith in the general underlying principle mm -hmm. to where you are more willing to look somewhere else right. and find uh, something. But if you don't have enough faith mm -hmm. to at least try, right. you'll never see it because you never actually look. I'd like to add one more thing, and it involves what Dr. Roth said earlier, uh, the question of moving into irrationalism, and that's what modern science can do. Looking at the two poles, the two starting points, if you start with faith and you never progress beyond faith, you can easily move into a world of irrationalism, very easily. And we have Christians that are doing that, you know, the sincere people, good people. If you start with seeing the world of science and never go beyond the boundaries there, so to speak, you can also get stuck in a world of irrationalism. So um, you've got to be careful. Um, but I think that when you combine the two, you do the best. Exactly. That was my point. <laughs> uh, I would just add, uh, truth is covers everything, okay? It does. And there are many ways of approaching it. And I respect those who approach truth from the side by faith. I wonder if their faith isn't based to certain on certain facts, like the historical accuracy of the Bible and so on. Uh, I'm much more comfortable with starting with science, which points to God, and then going to the Bible, I feel that's a more rational approach. I'm a little scared of faith, because it can, you know, you can have faith in anything, whether it be uh, Alice in Wonderland or the Book of Mormon or whatever. Uh, but uh, rationally, I feel more comfortable starting with science it points to God anyway next week we will move inside the universe for evidence of God uh, so come back <laughs>